Well, our experience was in shallow water, Adriatic Sea or the La Spezia Gulf. So really there, there is not a lot of reverb. Uh, maximum length uh, we did measure was around 0.3 seconds. Uh, in shallow water, the sound is very dry actually. Uh, I have a I have a question to Preston. Um, do you have data uh, about damping related to frequency in the audible range? Uh, yes. So, a um, couple of different things. Let, let me just share the the presentation again, really quickly, and I'll talk about the different things. So, um, I should say that reverberation has been studied at length for sonar applications since the end of World War II. There, there is literally uh, there are hundreds or thousands of, of academic scientific papers. There are many volumes of books and uh, there's a tremendous amount of information. And so people have characterized the frequency dependency of, of this type of interaction. For example, what, uh, how much sound penetrates the bottom and how much bounces back at different frequencies. It's fairly well known. Um, same is true for volume scattering. Uh, the, the, how much sound is scattered is a function of frequency. How much is potentially absorbed by these and not reflected, that's studied. Same with the surface. <clears throat> and then the, the water itself has attenuation and it's also frequency dependent. And actually have a, I have a picture of that. I thought that might be some question that was asked. So I'll just show you that really quickly uh, just from a website. Um, so that's, that's also known and uh, is dependent upon uh, frequency. And so this is an example here. This plot is attenuation just in the water column itself in decibels and here it's in kilometers. Um, and you show uh, saltwater curve is the dark line. I think you're and sharing then, the wrong oops, picture. Sorry, okay, let me try that again. All right, do you, do you see do you see a plot? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's attenuation just in the water in dB per kilometer. So it's not a lot. <clears throat> you have to travel a long way to suffer a certain amount of attenuation. This is would be one dB per kilometer at uh, 10 hertz. But as you go higher in frequency, it continues to increase. But it's also not constant. And these different uh, molecules in the water um, cause the, the frequency dependency to change. So I hope that that is at least the treble is answer. incredibly uh, non-damped. The, the the 10k is 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 easier to travel than the than the 100 hertz. Um, so there is more attenuation at high frequencies than at low. So this is this is down here. This is a log log scale. So this is 0. 0.0001 dB per kilometer. So it's basically negligible in the low frequencies. Ah. And then even when you go to the high frequencies, so yeah. yeah, so this is a hundred and this is only a thousand. Um, well, it's I guess it's all relative, right? Uh, that would be a hundred dB per kilometer, but that's only 0 0.1 dB uh, per meter. So, yeah, so and but it, can, it would continue. So, shallow water waveguide, low frequencies, no roughness. Uh, that sound would propagate very long with very little, um, very little attenuation, but very little would come back to the, to the, to the receiver uh, in that situation. Yeah, because my experience in this underwater laboratory was vice versa. I had a, a strong uh, reverberation time at 10K, but nothing at 1K. But this can be due to the microphone and to, due to the, the hydrophone and due to the, uh, the speaker mainly. And maybe the parallel walls in the, in the swimming pool. That was nothing else than a swimming pool with hard walls. So I could imagine uh, that was kind of a mode what, I, what we measured at 10K. Sounded anyway like a tin, uh, like a tin can, very, very uh, yeah, strange effect, not very um, pleasurous. Yeah, I would say that to fully understand it, we would need to know the frequency response of the source and the receiver. Exactly. Uh, I think the problem yes. is the speaker that he cannot uh, uh, induce space power in the water. It's very difficult to generate low frequency sound underwater with a yeah. small source because yeah. 
the general rule is the source needs to be approximately the size of the wavelength. Yeah. So at, at, at 1500 hertz, which is not even what we would think of as low, you need a sound source that's a meter in, in a spatial extent. And so go to 150, now you need a sound source that's 10 meters. It really doesn't exist. I so see. I, I think the problem is generating the low frequency sound underwater is very yeah. difficult. Uh, back to Christina's question. Uh, Christina, you are looking for spaces for high uh, reverberation time. What about, uh, you, you meant, ah, this was Lord, Lila. Uh, what about- um, can, can I just elaborate on that? We just talked about because what I feel from the recordings we already has is that there's a lot of high frequency reverb, but I'm really missing the middle and the low part. Exactly. And is that because uh, we have not a strong enough output? Yeah, that the is the test signal, the test signal problem, in my opinion. But um, I also point. noticed on one of your recordings, there was a high, uh, at least uh, one second you reached. Uh, uh, I don't know where it was. Um, what about my idea was uh, you, you have, you have uh, mentioned the Faroe Islands and they have some caves there, very famous caves where even some musician made uh, some saxophone recordings in the caves. Um, isn't that the idea to make um, uh, underwater um, a measurement in these caves where it's a lot, lot of stone in a, in a, in a white, uh, I mean, the, you need volume. You need at least four times the volume of a concert hall to have uh, a similar uh, experience with, your, with the human ears. Yes, exactly. That was, uh, what was our plan to try well, um, some of those caves, but the problem was that the weather, it was not mm -hmm. with us in all, all the guys who had the boats who could uh, take us there. They uh, had to step back because we said this is uh, pretty dangerous with waves to go into the caves. Yeah, so, I see. so actually we still, uh, we're still talking about it. We still want to try it out and see. Uh, we though have managed to try a small little cave, but I think it was too small and because of the plants, uh, see, see, seaweed on the sides on the walls. We we didn't get nothing. Or it was too short. It was like it's not yeah. it's not yeah. so present, but uh, a little bit. But yes, this is this was a main idea of the far islands to try the caves. Because I I understand the whole project. You need the kind of a concert hall, right? You need a kind of a concert hall acoustics, and you you search, you are searching for such a length of a concert hall underwater. Uh, well, it's um, it's more to to use uh, this. I mean, to record the vibrations from different places um, in the Nordic or somewhere else, maybe, and then reproduce it. It's more more this way. Else, um, well, let's say uh, back to the history of aquasonic. Uh, when uh, when when aquasonic start begin, that was one of the idea to try to play all together in the same water filled kind of. Uh, to be so much same 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 uh, water tank or how it's called the swimming pool and it didn't really work well because the sound is spreading so good in the water so if the small uh, clicks pumps they just go in immediately and when the people uh, move around and uh, moving things it's just a mess of the sound <laughs> actually yeah, yeah. so uh, i mean that's why it's became to be in separate things for each musician but uh, the idea of uh, reverberation underwater that could be really useful for us for a live performance just to uh, use it on top of the yeah yes my experience it takes quite long to find the best places yeah exactly i mean that's that's one of the big question how to find the good places and i mean yeah, yeah. we already i will talk about it later how what mm. we did exactly and how okay how did it what does work what didn't work and the, question how can we do it better yeah. so so this is probably a very naive question to to the experts here but but uh, the perception of sound uh, through the human ear is essentially what we here would would uh, would use to determine sound quality so so this is not a technical evaluation of sound quality it is, as, as what Ralph uh, alluded to in the beginning, it's this very careful investigation, what sounds right, what sounds wrong, what delay do we need, what, what, uh, what uh, fields do we need. But, but the human ear 
changes dramatically when immersed in water. So, so in addition to the reverberation you have, you're looking for, I guess you should also know exactly how the human ear changes and how that changes the perception. Because we are, we are programmed to understand sound based on, on the propagation of sound in air. And, and if we go underwater, our perception changes completely. So, so what might, from a technical point of view, be the ideal sort of reverberation underwater might be absolutely terrible when we have to process it through our brain. Yes, and there is no, exp no, no experience in the human brain. I don't go to the water to hear a, a concert normally, you know. That's, uh, I never heard the concert underwater. I heard there are some projects, some um, wellness hotels, they have uh, underwater loudspeakers, but they are not very nicely tuned. So I never had a good result in those, in those areas. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's fun, but because nobody expects reverb in underwater. Exactly, exactly. And this is something we'll go, go a bit more further into uh, in, in, in the third part, but seeing that we're a bit delayed, uh, we just want you to, uh, to go. I could see on the chat that, that uh, uh, Chris was uh, saying something about low frequencies and, uh, and human activities. I would like to go a bit further into that, Chris. So what's the question? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, you were talking about the low frequencies, uh, how to generate some of these frequencies uh, from, from human activities. Uh, no. Yeah, for, so if you intend to make sound at low frequencies, it's usually quite difficult because you need a big source, but uh, we are putting a, big, a lot of big sources in the environment. So, so if, you're, if, if you have a ship, the ships that are going on or the air guns that are used for seismic exploration or the, the piles that are driven for wind turbines, etc., these are all uh, enormous sound sources. And uh, by recording close to something like that, you might get... Uh, quite a good recording of what's, what's happening at low frequencies in that environment so but then you, you should use the the opportunity of other activities that uh, might be an ex a way forward but then yeah the pile driving for example could be a good example but as already explained in this this uh, meeting uh, in in the pile driving is generally done in shallow water and that reverberation is quite quite low actually that uh, so you for for the for uh, something to experience it as as a, as a listener to hear reverb you need what was discussed already as well you need a big bigger space and deeper water and uh, so, so it's not, it's not that easy. If I may uh, add to that, uh, there's um, a, a range of natural sounds that are impulsive that could be quite useful for for assessing reverberation, uh, and they can occur in a variety of different uh, environments. But I'm thinking particularly of um, uh, ice cracks uh, and uh, sperm whales are a, a particularly good natural loud source, but it's only those are only in the case of sperm whales, at least uh, largely in deep water. Um, what I would add to the previous discussion, though, um, is that the degree to which the uh, surrounding materials matter. Um, to the reverberance is um, depends a, a great deal on the separation from the source to the receiver. So, um, if you are if the source and receiver are quite close, then reflections from the surface and the bottom uh, walls, in the case of a cave or a canyon, will all matter. They will all um, uh, arrive at the receiver. If the source and the receiver are widely spaced, then you're getting that modal um, propagation that uh, the Preston was uh, describing. Uh, and that really depends upon the, um, it depends much more upon the sound speed profile in the water, the, um, the temperature and pressure in the water than it does upon the, the surface and, and bottom. Ultimately, the further away you are, the, um, the surface and bottom are basically not uh, a factor at all. So uh, one question is you know, sort, of a, sort of a fundamental question thinking about um, uh, reverberation underwater is, is what is the source and and uh, receiver spacing that you have in mind. You know, uh, in, a, uh, in a in a performance environment, you you, you think of those as being relatively close to that. You've got intimacy and so on, but uh, that is almost certainly underwater going to result in relatively simple and um, and probably musically unattractive slap type of echoes as compared to a longer separation. Yeah, I, I think that that goes along with some of the recordings that I listened to where you clearly get one of those surface reflections 
those recordings you posted, um, you, you know, you had the hammer as the source and- It's a Westmana, one of those, yes. I guess it's this one you're talking about. Yeah, you, you can clearly hear, it's probably the surface, maybe the bottom. You hear one of those uh, kind of discrete echoes and then a little bit of reverberation after. I think it's gonna be real hard to get rid of those discrete, the first couple of surface bounces uh, and bottom bounces are gonna probably still sound like discrete echoes. Yeah, that's true until you are multiple um, times the, uh, if you think of the, the bottom dimension or the width of the, you know, wh wherever your, your boundaries are, if you're multiple times that distance away from the source, then you're going to start getting more complex uh, reverberation and the, uh, you're going to get that more modal propagation as well. So yeah, if you're, if you're co-located with the source, you're going to get a, a very simple echoes. Yeah, so in, if you go looking for this in the literature, you'll hear the words monostatic and bistatic, which monostatic means the source and the receiver at the same place. And a lot of sonars are monostatic. So there's a lot of work on monostatic reverb, but then source and receiver separated, we call that bistatic. So that's what Mark was talking about. One more thing I would add there is um, that, uh, <laughs> particularly so perhaps middle distance, as we can say, from a, from a sound source, uh, you can have sound go into the bottom and then propagate through the bottom and then re-radiate. Uh, so uh, that will give a, um, so an, a slightly unusual situation where you can get sound going through the bottom and arriving at the sound source, uh, at the receiver rather, um, more rapidly than it will go through the direct channel through the water because sound will go faster through the substrate uh, than it does through the water. So you can get um, some, some interesting complicated environments at that sort of middle distance that do depend upon uh, uh, the bottom and, and the structure within the bottom even. Uh, looking at some echoes that, uh, that I've had from um, uh, coming back from sperm whale clicks, for example, um, you can very easily see echoes off the bottom, but moreover, you can see echoes off substrata below the bottom, yeah, which is I, exactly I what uh, what air gun um, surveys are used for in, in trying to find oil underwater. Yeah, I left that out, but that's totally true. The, the layering underneath, if there's a hard layer uh, underneath the soft layer, and then the same uh, people calculate volume reverberation inside the sediment because the sediment is full of stuff like this as well. So that's uh, absolutely true. So thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I ignored that in what I presented. Would also be interesting to hear Gorm if you have any experience with any of these uh, underwater recordings uh, in your work. Uh, if, if you can uh, add anything to the discussion, we uh, mainly operate with uh, pings. That is a short tone burst, and uh, sometimes uh, we use uh, frequency modulated signals, uh, which is like uh, woo woo. And the closest we get to that in the nature is in from dolphins. Um, we haven't. We have customers who who buy hydrophones and record uh, what's called ambient noise. And uh, I've been on conferences where there are topics where they talk about ambient noise. And um, I thought maybe if you recorded ambient noise, maybe from you could choose to go uh, in, uh, in areas with a lot of traffic and uh, you could choose to go on more quiet places. You might be able to take the sound data and play with it. And if, if you are not politically against uh, using digital instruments to, to tune and pitch, you might get some experience that could lead to something that could sound uh, interesting. For example, they have uh, the ast in astronomy. They have recorded the the background from the universe and uh, shifted the frequency down to the audible range, and it sounds quite interesting. And you might do something in the same manner with with uh, with ambient noise. 
but I, I think your your goal is quite a, I'm I'm constantly thinking what is it you want to do do you want to sing uh, do what kind of instruments do do you want to play a violin um, because another thing which I'm and that's a question um, when we talk and when we sing and we make music, it's very complicated signals. Whereas I perceive uh, sound from animals as being quite uh, simple uh, uh, in a sense. Any comments? Uh, yes, I have a like kind of answer on your question about what exactly, I will show you an example. I don't know, maybe you heard, heard that already. This one of the, results we get um, and we put it in a dry recorded vocal underwater just to give the perspective of what what can it be or which way we're going and uh, how more musical it sounds uh, immediately as soon as you put the reverb and because of the problem because we want to escape and go away from the like always digital reverbs i mean always um, artificial reverbs and we want to go to a more natural kind of and present the underwater i mean to show to people that underwater is also actually acoustic exist it's also there and it's, it can be really different place to place and like kind of to show people that uh, animals also use it actually as a like for yeah in different uh, perspective yes like to short answer on your question yeah i i saw on your your web page uh, there was some examples where I think it, it was one of the ladies who were sitting in a cavity filled with uh, water and they were singing. And um, it's, it's not like Kate Bush or because it's not possible uh, with your voice uh, to, to create a similar sound on the water. You're, you're kind of limited. We, we are not living in the underwater environment. Yes, exactly. That's why it's so exciting uh, to try to um, to introduce to people how it's maybe could be, or maybe it's in a parallel universe somewhere existing, or I mean, yeah. it's imagination is going really wild here. So I would like to pick up on a point that, that Gorm said, which I, I think is, it was something that I was thinking about when you circulated the agenda here is that uh, the ambient environment underwater, the ambient noise environment is kind of a critical part of the underwater experience. If you, if you stick your head underwater, you know, particularly near the, uh, a tropical coast, you'll hear um, nonstop snapping shrimps uh, in rocky reefs and colder climates. You'll hear um, uh, sea urchins, the little resonance of their cavities. You'll hear um, uh, marine mammals and so on. Uh, as well as, of course, wave and uh, and rain noise and, and all of those things, that um, for me at least would feel just as important to a, um, an authentic underwater experience as as mimicking the reverberation. I, I'm wondering to what extent you'd be interested in following that up. It is very interesting, and I love all these underwater sounds. and And, and there is a lot of artists working with that, and um, and uh, we also uh, ask um, when we have recorded sounds in Faroe Islands, there is an artist working with these sounds. But in, in our case, we are more occupied with, um, like we have these whole libraries of different reverbs above water. And we really would like to have these mapping libraries of different reverbs underwater to put them on our music. Is that answer enough, Mark? Yeah, no, certainly. I, I, I can I can understand the focus here, and uh, yeah, I just I think it's uh, it may also be that um, by providing uh, the ambient environment to some extent, you mask um, the uh, absence of of a very authentic reverberant tail, right? So if it's not possible to get a a, a completely um, authentic reverberation, the having a background noise that's authentic at least perhaps fills in the details if you like a little bit or, or at least it masks the uh, the simplicity of the the reverberation um, i i am interesting if there's any of having experience of how 
we can get a louder impulse response um, or impulse underwater without uh, damaging uh, the animals uh, that is always suffering from too much noise. Is that anyhow possible? Uh, and I don't know if Angelo have some experience or other of you have experience with that. Yeah, um, Lila, jump in a bit forward to the uh, next, but uh, yeah, that's a thing, like just short explanation that we using the underwater speakers, actually Angelo using the same speakers. So that's was nice to see <laughs> that we are not alone <laughs> in this. And um, that was the problem that um, in the water, the big problem is uh, we're moving all the time. Even if you have an anchor and stuff, the little breeze and uh, like the waves in the water, you're moving it around. And we're using like the sweep tones you may, might heard in the recordings for those who didn't hear before. It's like the long sinus tone, which is going from a low to high frequencies. And it's like, woo, and it's take time. And when it's take time to catch all reflections and stuff. And while we're doing it, we're moving around already. We're already 10 meters away from the place we started and stuff. So all we said is to start the sound and we are not getting the clear uh, picture of the um, sound uh, of the uh, reflections in the water. So the idea was we find out the hammer it's much easier because it's very short impulse. You like you click and when you have a short time, like it's I mean if it's really long reverb, you can take wait for five, ten seconds, but at least it's still a much shorter time to 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 get the reflections back. So uh, this is kind of solving a pretty big part of this problem, but the problem and our problem is the good sound source to find because the hammer is good uh, to check if there's something or not and just move forward. But for recording, the, because the frequency range is so uh, unclear there and it's going so crazy, of course, with technologies now, with software, you have possibilities to kind of flatten it down, but still it's not showing uh, the real picture of the uh, how, how real reverb sounds there. And this is the biggest problem for us to... If we want to, um, if we want to represent the real vibration, then we have to get it also kind of real. And um, so the question is, is it possible, or do you have some experience or ideas? What can it be? Kind of short gun maybe a uh, thing, but not so damageable, uh, de not so powerful, uh, not so what's called. Um, not to not to damage the water creatures and stuff like to find this balance what can it be and uh, what kind of solutions we can find here so i don't know if some of you have some experience or ideas uh, what can it be what we used to use a, a lot was uh, light bulbs uh, so yeah, just an old an old incandescent light bulb if you throw it over the side uh, at a certain depth it will collapse uh, yeah, how, how deep it can have to uh, be. Well, it depends upon the light bulbs. Uh, yeah, we, we found <laughs> we found that um, they're getting the cheapest possible ones from uh, from Walmart would work pretty well. Uh, oh, they, they, they'd go quite shallow, but I mean, we were working in in several hundred meters water depth. Yes, I remember we talking been been talking with Maunus about it, and but he said actually it's not allowed. Is it because it's too hard inputs? Is it true, Maunus? I remember we talked about it. Well, I think it's. I, I don't think it's uh, regulated to throw light bulbs overboard. So, okay, yeah. but uh, you have to be yeah. a bit careful. We did it uh, when we recorded sperm whales, and uh, and a light bulb uh, will generate some, uh, you know, 180, 200 dBs. So it's okay, it's really intense sound. So yes, depends yeah. on. What about especially the... given, especially given that we're recording this, <laughs> I should probably clarify that uh, that we also did this a long time ago. This was back in the day. This is how it used to be done, um, and yeah. uh, and I think you know now we're much more cognizant of the of the potential impact of of any sound that we add in, into the water, and so that, that yes. would need to be evaluated. On top of that, throwing stuff deliberately into the water doesn't seem like a great idea either. Yeah. Okay. But what about frequency frequency range? The bulb, they can, it's also bulb to bulb can be different, isn't it? Uh, it can be some peaks and some certain frequencies or uh, some gaps or something. Yes, and it depends on the implosion depth. And there are papers written about this. So this is a sort of okay. a well-described method, actually. But, okay. Uh, it, it, it has a lower frequency emphasis, which means like a few, you know, free, from a few kilohertz and downwards. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah. And in shallow waters, you can build a, we built, we have several prototypes of machines cracking light bulbs in shallow waters. So okay. Can, can you I tell can about you it? Draw, they're actually in uh, somewhere in Aarhus, I think. Oh, really? Well, this could be interesting to you. <laughs> some of them worked and some they, some didn't work at all. Some need to fix. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I have to remember to talk about it. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I had like one question for this part and maybe, I don't know, Christian, maybe it will be the last one for uh, now. Uh, I have like, a comment on, on your question. Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe if you took a hydrophone and went to uh, like Abletoft or something, yeah. when the ferry is passing, you record the signal or somewhere where the ferry is passing, uh, this ferry is, uh, it's not an ordinary vessel, it's, you know, it's a jet turbine thing. Uh, so it uh, generates huge amount of noise, which is actually very bad for the environment, but that's another thing. Um, but if you take the, if you record a signal and then uh, get the frequency spectrum, and then you can estimate a kind of impulse response. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. I, I think a, it's an interesting idea going, but I just can't see it working. Firstly, that that source is, is somewhat distributed; it's moving very, very fast. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We've recorded that actually. If you want to try it, we've recorded it many a time on porpoises um, with our tags, so we've got uh, we've got a lot of data to work with. But my suspicion is that that's um, that's really not going to be um, yeah. a workable solution for this. And, and just plus to understand, if you have this sound source which is noisy all the time, nonstop, how to to take those uh, reflections from this recording. That's also a bit, a bit tricky. Yeah, but uh, okay, that's interesting. I would just have a last question, uh, I think for this part, like um, if you're looking for different shapes of reverberation, so we are looking for, we're looking for a short ones and for long ones and uh, especially long ones because the sound of speed in water is four times faster, yeah, uh, compared to the air. Uh, so, it means like is it do i understand correct the distance for for the same amount of reverberation in water have to be four times longer than in air is it correct Act. yes okay it's and so, so it means if we want to like i don't know for, let's say a big reverb in five seconds uh, so it means that it's have to be it's it's have to, it's have to be some kilometers isn't it for sound going traveling back and forwards if you imagine a room filled with water, yeah, the length is appears as the volume. So it's the length cubed. <laughs> you know, if you remember that formula that I showed. Um, so yeah, if, if you're just talking about time to a, you know, a single echo to come back, then yeah, just the the uh, the, the length and the sound speed difference. But in the reverb term, it's the volume. I wanted to show you all uh, one possibility. You can purchase commercial um, sound sources that are uh, fairly decent at producing low frequency sound. And um, I'll just show you a website. They're very expensive, but they exist. And some of you all may know about this Lubell. Can you all see uh, my, my web browser? So this little company called Lubell, they make these, they're basically electromechanical loudspeakers just like you would find in, um, in an airborne speaker, but they're made for underwater and they're good down to about uh, 100 hertz, which is pretty good for a low frequency sound source, but, and it's not really flat and it only goes up to about 1500, but um, that's kind of the kind of thing you could potentially achieve, but these cost about, uh, well, $10,000. <laughs> so, and they, they have other ones that are smaller and less expensive and therefore not as low frequency. So there's another one that's uh, only goes down to about a kilohertz, but goes to 10. So just like in an airborne system, you would need multiple transducers to, to cover a wide band and then you could project your signals that way, play play music, whatever, rather than just an impulse, as as was discussed. And we do we do have one other solution that we can talk about later for uh, making impulses that are not as loud as is um, uh, air guns. Um, 
something we do in my the funded work that I work on from the Navy. They they try real hard to minimize the the damage to marine life. So we've been working on a a replacement for explosives for a long time, and I can tell you more about that a little later, maybe better discussion offline. But um, so there are some replacements, if you will, that are less loud, still are very impulsive, but more uh, environmentally friendly. But also not not super easy, not not as easy as buying a light bulb and uh, cracking it underwater. It, it, and it, what I'm talking about is research tools that aren't commercially available, but at least they exist. Um, yeah. Thank you, Preston. I just uh, I think we have to 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 uh, round this discussion now. But I just want as a final thing, I would like to because uh, Angelo uh, has um, has some recordings and some reverbs we could listen to. So that would be nice to to finish this um, this uh, this discussion with uh, with Angelo and we hear some some practical uh, let's say um, <clears throat> uh, experience on 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 what's been doing uh, what he's been doing. <clears throat> okay. So I can share my screen perhaps and see if it works. Share computer sound. So you can also hear uh, that was the loudspeaker we did use is called uh, the Diluvio loudspeaker from Clark Synthesis. It's quite cheap, much cheaper than the Lubel, but actually uh, close in performance, not so powerful perhaps, but uh, the frequency range more or less is the same, 100 Hertz to 15 kilohertz. Uh, here you can see the system mounted. It is another loudspeaker for high frequency is an ETC 1007 piezoelectric sphere, but this only operates above 1.5 kilohertz. So it's not good for low frequency. It was located on one bot. The other bot was the receiving bot. Uh, on the receiving bot, there was a, a, um, an hydrophone, which was again an ETC or a Bruele Kier one. So this was the equipment. Uh, we did play exponential sign sweep. Uh, if I remember correctly, 30 seconds long. It's true that the source and the receiver are moving, but uh, the result is good if you deconvolve the signal with the proper technology. Uh, traditional deconvolution technique means uh, spectral division, and this is terrible if the system is time variant, and in this case is time variant. But we developed another deconvolution technique which does not uh, require spectral division. It is time domain convolution with the inverse sweep, and this creates a very uh, good uh, impulse response even when the system is time variant. So that is the trick, allowing to measure with a little power loudspeaker uh, with no noise pollution because the sound is barely audible. And in the same time, you get an impulse response. We measure at a different distance. Here, the number is the uh, nautical miles. So 0 0.08 nautical miles is probably 100 meter, and this is 0.12 nautical miles. This is 0.25 nautical miles. So this is the typical impulse response. Now I amplified it so it's louder. Okay, let's try and playing it. It was repeated twice, so just listen to one. Is very dry. If we now compute the, sorry, if we now compute the reverberation time with the acoustical parameter plugin, uh, this is the impulse response in time domain. As you see, you easily reach the background noise. This flat area here is noise, is not reverb anymore. The reverb is just here, which ends in 0.04. Or 0 0.05 second, so really short. This is the reverberation time. This value is probably wrong. And as you see, the value are around 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 uh, second maximum, the length of the reverb. Let's try this other one at short distance. 
uh, okay, more or less the temporal is the same. As you see, reverberation time change with frequency. Uh, it's larger at low frequency than very high frequency, and it's smaller at medium frequency. We don't know why, but uh, definitely the absorption and the other acoustical effects are frequency dependent. Uh, also, in this case, the sound is very dry. Mm. This one is probably at even larger distance. Let's listen to this one. At amplitude normalized. Again, the spectrum has a lot of high frequency. Compute the reverberation time. Mm, here there is a lot of noise because the signal to noise ratio now is poor. We are more far from the source. So uh, the signal to noise is really bad. In fact, uh, T20 can measure it only at few frequency. Uh, now we are close to the limit of our system and we are just at uh, 200 meters more or less from the source. Uh, with, uh, with this system, we cannot go much uh, far away. Last point I want to show you is uh, how to go spatial uh, information. Instead of using a single hydrophone, we are using a tetrahedral hydrophone array with four hydrophones. You see this, the Aquarian Audio hydrophones uh, with a four channel recorder uh, inside a waterproof uh, case. Here you see the whole system with the hydrophone and the case for the recorder. Uh, this, uh, that's my son uh, mounting it on the bottom of the sea. That's the probe. And uh, this is when we did measure it in the pool with a turntable for characterizing the directivity pattern. From this four channel array, we get ambisonic signal. Ambisonics means spherical harmonics, uh, which is something like that. Uh, those are the spherical harmonic signal. So Omnidirectional means uh, uh, pressure, sound pressure. And these are the three Cartesian components of particle velocity. Particle velocity is what uh, uh, marine uh, animals feel because while uh, humans or mammals are equipped with sound pressure sensor, fish, crustaceans, and mollusks are equipped with particle velocity sensor. So with this uh, new array, hydrophone array, we can record spatial sound underwater. And we have a couple of examples of spatial sound, uh, underwater spatial sound available on my website. This was a recording made with a panoramic camera at Maldives. That's my wife, she made the recording. And uh, you can listen to the sound of those small fish. The fish are doing this sound. This is a spatial audio recording. So if you watch this wearing headphones and a head mounted display like an Oculus visor, you can look around and listen around and you hear the direction of sound. We have another experiment we recorded at uh, Panarea uh, in uh, Sicily. That's me actually, oops, sorry. Wow, what's that? Let's play playing. Mm. Too much zoom, I don't know why. No, sorry, we need to refresh the page probably. Yeah, okay. That's my son. As you see, 360 degree video, that's me. That's Daniel, the other, my colleague. The color map show the direction of arrival of sound, where the sound is louder 
and we try making sound for checking the direction of arrival. So this is some uh, um, scientific equipment on the sea bottom. You see the bubble coming from the sea bottom. They are making environmental noise because this is a volcanic area. So there is uh, uh, carbon dioxide bubbles uh, coming out from the seabed, you see. And we are checking how our system is working. So that's me. The system should show the direction of arrival of sound. Now I go against this structure and I try making sound hitting it with the knife. That's great. Thank you very much, Angelo. I, okay. I have to stop you here because sorry, time is sorry. running. Yeah, time is going. It's so good. I see your son already sent the YouTube and we will have a good look at it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yes. yes. So I think we were just going to have like, uh, so people can just uh, stretch their legs for, for, for two minutes and then we will move on to the last part because I think this uh, first and second part, they got mixed a bit, a bit up. So I think that's, that's uh, really great. So I think if we just take a, a small break so people can stretch their legs, we will, we will go on to, um, to start talking about this, what CERN also raised this question about how we are perceiving this. So um, see, see you back here in, in, in two minutes, just so you can have a small uh, glass of water or something. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 